Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free sports premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. I made a video yesterday about Richard Schaefer's exit from Golden Boy. I did not expect the responses that I got to that video. That video uh, has led to a great, robust discussion here online uh, that I've enjoyed. I encourage everyone to take a look at the comment section to yesterday's video. Right? Some very eye-opening comments and thoughts. Um, let me follow up on some of the thoughts. There seems to be a prevailing mood out there, and uh, it's, it's interesting, that the Cold War in boxing, the fact that Golden Boy under Richard Schaefer and Top Rank under Bob Arum couldn't get together to agree on some big fights has greatly hindered the sport, right? And people blame Richard Schaefer for that, right? The idea is that when Schaefer said, hey, I'm not going to deal with Bob Arrow, that that deprived fans the opportunity to see Manny Pacquiao against several Golden Boy fighters, right? It deprived us of the opportunity to see Floyd Mayweather against Manny Pacquiao and several top rank fighters. Now, let's just talk about negotiations for a second because I think that uh, that idea is wrong. Right? We'll disagree. We can argue about it. Let's argue about it here. First, let's just talk about negotiations. Understand in any negotiation, when you sit down at the table to negotiate with a second party, you need to have the power to say no. Right? If you don't have the power to say no, it's not a negotiation. The other party is simply dictating terms to you. Right? And so understand, you need to always be able to get up and walk away from the table if the other side quite frankly isn't making the deal such that your side gets its benefit of the bargain let me go one step further and I understand many people disagree with me on different points here right tell me about the disagreements in the comment section to this video the other point of a negotiation is that you can't just merely split your differences halfway and think you've reached a deal. Right? If you come in with the idea that you're going to demand 100 but you'll accept 50 and that everything should be decided that way, then you're going to have an impossible situation that has a moral hazard in it. Right? Both parties would have an incentive to make outrageous initial demands. Maybe you're not plausibly entitled to a hundred. Right? Understand, you don't want a situation where people sit down and say, Hey, my fighter wants a hundred million dollars for this fight. Hoping that you're foolishly going to agree to pay them fifty million dollars for the fight. Right? The halfway point isn't magic. Right? The fact that you ask for X, the other side asks for Y and then says, you know what, we'll meet you halfway, doesn't mean that either you or the other side has been fair. Right? You need to get rid of this idea that the halfway point between the two positions is the fair position. It's not, especially not when you're dealing with sophisticated negotiators. Right? It's not. 
You have to come in with your own market research about what you think is right. The best negotiators I've come across come in with real numbers out the gate with real data to support those numbers. Right? That should be the strategy. Not outrageous demands. Also, you have people who, of course, act clueless. Right? You know, they're crazy like a fox. They'll come in and they'll act clueless about what actual market numbers are. That's not a good situation either. That gets me to my next point. There's sometimes when you're ready to settle a case, not a case or let's say negotiate a deal in boxing, but the other side is simply not ready. Right? If you realize when you sit down and you're there with your numbers, you're there with your offers, you know privately that it's a win-win, right? You're offering a fair and equitable resolution here to get the deal done. And you figure out that the other side has misjudged their market value, right? Hasn't done in-depth preparation on the numbers or the logistics right and is posing and is trying to feel you out hoping that you're going to pay way above market then in my opinion you have to just slow play the negotiation time is your friend right until the other side does their homework right let me give a specific example. What if I told you that at one point Manny Pacquiao received from Mayweather Promotions and Golden Boy, right? Now understand, I'm a boxing outsider. I'm not here breaking news or claiming to have inside information. I'm just going on public reports that you can Google. Right, I've done some preparation for this video. What if I told you that at one point, Golden Boy, Richard Schaefer, working with Mayweather Promotions, right on behalf of Mayweather Promotions, made an offer to top rank, whereby Manny Pacquiao would receive 50% of the purse. Think about it, 50 percent of the purse right but of course at that point Golden Boy and Mayweather wanted what is now standard in boxing in high-profile fights they wanted drug testing right what they were asking for was to have both fighters not just Pacquiao, but Pacquiao and Mayweather, subject to random drug testing. Right? Think about it. Now, the response they got was that Manny Pacquiao was afraid of needles. Right? This is Manny Pacquiao with tattoos. Manny Pacquiao was afraid of needles. And for that reason, Manny Pacquiao didn't want to agree to drug testing. There's even a further story, if you dig deep enough, where Manny Pacquiao felt that the drug testing in a fight against Eric Morales hurt him. The idea, and it's racially charged, so be prepared for it, is that Manny Pacquiao believed that taking blood right before a fight severely weakened him. And the idea was that whatever medical science had to say about it, right? Manny Pacquiao, a Filipino, right, did not trust medical science and knew from his personal experience, right, as someone from the third world, that medical science couldn't be trusted on this issue. 
right now all I'm saying is simply this and keep in mind this is against the backdrop where later right Manny Pacquiao's nutritionist at the time Alex Ariza would be called shady by Manny Pacquiao's own trainer Freddie Roach this is against a backdrop where a later Alex Ariza client Brandon Rios failed a drug test after a fight right and so the point is simply this if Golden Boy and Mayweather felt that drug testing was an important issue and they were prepared to make it bilateral right in other words what they were asking they were prepared to give Right, Mayweather was prepared to submit to drug testing. And if that request was met with non scientific claims that random drug testing would weaken Manny Pacquiao, right? That's in essence what the claims were, right? And that the drug testing would cause emotional trauma to Manny because Manny's afraid of needles and stuff like that then understand at that point the parties weren't ready to make a deal right the Mayweather and Golden Boy people came to the table with an even deal proposal which was rejected right the drug testing concern of course isn't isolated to Golden Boy and Mayweather, right? Now you have several champions saying, look, I want drug testing before a fight. You've even had guys in championship fights. You heard me mention Brandon Rios. There's also Antonio Tarver, right? There are others. I, I believe Andre Berto failed a drug test somewhere along the way, right? There are many elite fighters now who are failing drug tests. I would argue that Mayweather promotions and Golden Boy promotions in that negotiation were protecting their fighter. You have a bottom line in negotiations that you should never go below. If you're protecting your fighter and if you have a valid concern about drug testing, right? Whether Manny Pacquiao is using drugs or not, if you're concerned about it and you need to have it addressed, and the other side doesn't, then you aren't in agreement to make the fight happen. Right? Even when you're offering the other side 50%. Now the public, curiously, and I do consider it curious, seems to blame Golden Boy and Mayweather for the Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather fight not happening. Right? That's ridiculous. Understand too that market power changes over time. Years later Manny Pacquiao suddenly was willing to submit to drug testing to have the fight made. The problem is by the time that change of heart took place Manny Pacquiao had had some fights that diminished his market power. Right at the end of the Marquez Pacquiao fourth fight, excuse me, not the fourth fight, but the third fight, there were many in that arena who thought Marquez had won the fight. Look at the end of the twelfth round. Marquez himself thought he won the fight. Right? Um, they announced that Manny Pacquiao won the fight. It was so controversial, they had to do it again. Meanwhile, of course, you know, Floyd fought Marquez. They were able to make that deal. Think about it. Right? Marquez was able to make the deal with Floyd. If Floyd offered Manny 50%, and was turned down and Floyd was able to make the deal with Marquez 
then who's ducking who here? Right? Think it through. Let me, uh, let me also make another point. It'll shake up people here. Understand that promoters seek specific titles in order to avoid other fighters. Right? Understand the way these sanctioning bodies do business. Many of them don't want to recognize a champion of a rival organization as a number one contender. So let's look at 168 pounds, right? Also understand too, there's no purse bid if the other fighter is not in an elimination match or the other fighter is not the mandatory. So you have perfect cover if you're a champion and the guy you want to avoid is one of the other champions, right? Your sanctioning body may never order you to fight him, right? That's why when you hear that a guy is a unified champion, it means a lot, right? A guy holding multiple belts does deserve a wow. But even a unified champion has guys that he's not going to fight. Let's look at a concrete example. Let's look at 168 pounds. Let's just understand. Andre Ward has fought Mikel Kessler. Beat him. Has fought Carl Franch. Has beat him. Has fought Saki Obika. Has beat him. Understand, Franch holds two titles right now. Bika holds one of the titles at 168 pounds. Right? In sum... Really, an argument that Andre Ward hasn't fought the best in his division is incredible. Right? It's just not. Andre Ward, as I make this video, is unbeaten. Right? Isn't Andre Ward exactly the kind of guy who should be, given the quality of opposition he's fought, given his unbeaten record, given that he won the Super 6 tournament, isn't he exactly the kind of guy who should be at least a mandatory challenger for the sanctioning bodies for which he doesn't have the belt? But this is boxing. And boxing doesn't always make sense. So a guy Ward B, Carl Froch, has two of the belts. Right now, let's look more closely at Carl Froch, right? I told you earlier in an earlier video that boxing's not just about the fighters and the promoters it's about the sanctioning bodies now things worked out handsomely for Carl Froch he just knocked out George Groves in the rematch but understand after beating George Groves in controversial fashion in the first fight understand that Carl Froch didn't want the rematch Right? That rematch, which ultimately drew 80,000 people in one of the most watched boxing events in recent memory, that rematch was the result of the sanctioning body saying, No, Carl, you need to give this guy a rematch. Right? The sanctioning body stepped in and pressured Carl Froch into the rematch. Now, Carl Froch won the rematch. Carl Froch has two of the belts. But understand, Eddie Hearn, Carl Froch's promoter, has openly said he doesn't want to fight Andre Ward again. Understand, Carl has cover because Andre Ward is a different champion at 168. No sanctuary body is going to order Carl Froch to fight Andre Ward. Carl's happy with the belts he has. Let's go one step further. Carl has two belts. James DeGale is the mandatory for one of the belts. Carl, of course, has said he wants to fight in Vegas. Why would a fight between two Englishmen in a town that just gave you 80,000 fans for a fight, why would the two Englishmen want to travel across the Atlantic to fight in Las Vegas in an arena that holds less than 20,000 people? Right? The bottom line is Carl doesn't want to fight James DeGale. I suspect Carl knows James DeGale is too difficult. 
Now since Carl has two belts, he has cover. He can give the Gale one of the belts. You know how you do that. You say, hey, I'm not going to fight James the Gale. Then they strip you. Think about it. Carl Frotch's problems are solved. Andre Ward has a belt. Carl doesn't have to worry about him. Right? Because he's not Carl's mandatory. If James the Gale gets a belt, Carl doesn't have to worry about him either. Because he won't be Carl's mandatory. So Carl gets to talk big game. He gets to fight the fights he wants. Chavez Jr., step right up. Mikael Kessier, you again, step right up. He gets to fight the fights he wants. He gets to keep himself in the news. He gets to enjoy his market power without having to deal with dangerous opponents like Ward and Gale. Right? Think about it. So think about his promoter. Think about the games people would play in public. Understand, Freddie Hearn, Carl Frotch is a cash cow. Why would Eddie give that up? So, if either Andre Ward or James DeGale goes on a media jihad and says, Hey, Carl, why won't you fight me? Give me a shot at the title. I'm guessing... The Frotch people would claim, hey, you know, uh, we might be interested in that fight. Go ahead and talk to us about it. They'll make that statement publicly because who wants to duck fighters publicly? But privately, Carl Frotch will be laughing all the way to the bank. If you're his promoter, why would you risk losing your cash cow? Why would you risk having Carl Frotch lose to Andre Ward again? when Carl is getting 80,000 people to stadiums for fights. Think about it. Right? So the Frotch people have no incentive. Right? They have the title they want. They don't have to be serious in any negotiation against Ward, DeGale, or Saki Obika who has another belt. Understand, that's the price we pay for having all of these sanctioning bodies. Let me go one step further, though. You'll always have more than one sanctioning body. Always. Because fights generate more revenue when a title's at stake. Right? If you only have one title at stake per division, then only one fight can be called a title fight. That's the fight the champ's in. But if you have four champions in the division, then four times as many fights can be called title fights. Right? But understand, as long as sanctioning bodies don't list other champions as mandatory contenders. You're not going to force a guy with a belt to fight a rival champion. Right? Let me make one final point. You know, purse bids don't just protect the fighters. Let's say a fight does go to a purse bid. Let's say I'm Kel Brook. Sean Porter is the champ. Right? My people and porters of people can't agree on the money. Right? Well, understand, purse bids also protect the promoters. Let's say you're the promoter and you're trying to make a deal with Sean Porter, who I understand is a free agent. Fair enough. Right? I thank the viewer for pointing that out to me. Right? That's why the comment section to these videos is so important. So let's say Sean Porter is a free agent. I go to Sean Porter and I say, Hey, Sean, what will it take to get you in the ring with Cal Brook, who's your mandatory? And let's say Sean Porter says, Hey, how much did Floyd make in his last fight? I want $30 million, blah, blah, blah. Now let's say I'm doing the math. I do my own market research. And let's say Sean Porter is not as popular as Floyd Mayweather. Well, understand, if the fight goes the purse bid, then Porter necessarily 
has to take the champion share of the purse bid or he would get stripped of his title. So understand if the fighters themselves have unrealistic expectations, right, the purse bid's actually an ego check because the purse bid will then bring the fighters expectations in line with the financial reality of the fight. So yes, I do love purse bids. That doesn't rule out promoters working with each other. But as I said before, there are times when you're talking to a promoter and they're not ready. If you offer the promoter 50% of the purse with random drug testing for all and you start hearing stories about needles stories about third world phobias about feeling weak after getting blood drawn right when you start hearing stories like that guess what that promoters not ready to make this fight right golden boy and top rank simply have not been ready to make several of the fights right the solution in my opinion for those situations is the purse bid procedure let me point out too that if either top rank or golden boy decides to just you know make fights happen regardless of the negotiations they'll be doing their fighter a disservice right so if you're meeting with a promoter you've offered 50 percent then you say you want drug testing which is a significant issue in a sport where so many have tested positive for drugs Let's look just at Oscar De La Hoya for a moment, right? Let's look at just Oscar De La Hoya for a moment. Now keep in mind, De La Hoya is supposed to be more friendly than Richard Schaefer to war top rank. In his career, you know that he fought Shane Mosley. Mosley now admits that for the rematch, he was on EPO. He was blood doping think about it that wasn't a level playing field now as it was and we can go back and look at the fight I thought Oscar De La Hoya clearly beat Shane Mosley in the rematch I thought he was robbed by the judges but understand too he was also robbed by Mosley's blood right because Mosley was artificially enhanced for that fight Look at the blood test results also for Oscar's fight against Fernando Vargas. If I'm correct, I believe there were problems with Vargas's post-fight drug sample. So Oscar himself has been a victim of opponents juicing. So if Oscar were representing Floyd Mayweather in negotiations with Manny Pacquiao's people, and if Mayweather said, look, I want drug testing, it's a big issue for me. If anyone should know that that concern is valid, it would be Oscar De La Hoya, wouldn't it? Is it progress for Oscar to then reach a deal that doesn't include drug testing? Does that help the sport in any way, shape, or form? Right? Fans, understand. You can't just demand that fights be made. The sport isn't helped by fake fights where one guy is juiced up. The disagreements between Golden Boy and Top Rank are very deep disagreements. It's not a personality clash. It's not the idea that Richard Schaefer, when he gets together with Bob Arum, they don't like the way the other person 
you know, uh, is talking to them. I don't believe that's it. If you believe the differences are substantive, that they actually involve requests that are outside of the normal course, if you believe that these multimillionaire groups would actually rather make money on big fights than by bickering, but that the bickering actually underscores real disagreements about big issues like drug testing, then the idea that Richard Schaefer leaving Golden Boy is now suddenly going to give us a golden age of fights that's in the fighter's best interest is absurd. Anyway, let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. My point is simply that collusion among promoters is a bad thing. I personally would rather fights not get made than to have fights get made that exploit the fighters financially or that exploit them physically where fighters are in the ring against juiced opponents. Right? I believe, based on what I've read, that the disagreements between Golden Boy and Top Rank are real disagreements. That if the sanctioning bodies are doing their best, if they're doing their job, then many of these big time fights between champions and mandatory contenders who have different promoters can be made via the purse bid system. Sometimes that's the only way fights are going to be made. Right? Understand at one point Mayweather picked up the phone, called Manny Pacquiao directly and said, look Manny, I will give you, I will guarantee you some huge amount of money. More than Manny has ever made for any fight in his entire career. Even that overture got slapped down. Understand the disagreements between the fighters and their representatives far exceed any personality conflict between any two individuals in the sport. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by again.